But the focus is on doing jobs in an economy with energy, the energy services. And so as we electrify, we can focus our energy, and for the engineers out there, our exergy, right? The bit of energy, the high-quality energy, the electricity that can do work for us, you focus it really specifically on end uses, energy services, and a whole lot of other nonsense just flows away. A whole lot of pollution, a whole lot of fern and waste flows away, and we apply energy. It's like moving from um, open heart surgery to laparoscopic surgery. That's what we're doing with electrification. There have been many energy transitions throughout human history. But this is the first one that is technology-led instead of commodity-led. The distinction is important for two reasons. One, electric technology is more efficient and now lower cost in most cases. Most importantly, it will become more efficient and even lower cost in the coming decades. Lower cost energy changes everything, our economies, our societies, even our political systems. Two, there's a new global energy leader, China. 20 years ago, China began investing in building and deploying clean energy technologies. Today, it's a clean energy giant, the first electrostate. Will the left, West be left behind? The United States and Europe are scrambling to catch up, but China intends to match them dollar for dollar. This geopolitical market and technology competition is helping to drive the energy transition faster than most people, especially fossil fuel incumbents, appreciate. Understanding the transforming global energy system is incredibly difficult. That's why we created this course, to give you a simple model that explains the big picture, which then helps you better understand the day-to-day -day stories. The course also includes comments from renowned global experts on the energy transition, some of them leading thinkers in the field. Future courses will use this model to explore other energy transition stories. Registration also entitles you to access the Energy U Library, where you'll find a wealth of energy journalism related to the course material. I'm energy journalist Markham Hislop, CEO of Energy Media. Welcome to The Future is Electric, How the Global Energy Transition Really Works. I think it is inevitable. I think it's also going to happen soon. Uh, I think renewables are very likely to take over the energy system uh, by 2040, 2045. Uh, and, you know, fossil fuels will be a niche item for probably mostly for making plastics. Um, uh, there's a, there is a question of, as a backup fuel, is that going to be natural gas? Uh, or is that going to be um, uh, green hydrogen? And uh, so, and how quickly will we push out natural gas as the backup fuel? There, the economics are murkier because uh, gas is probably going to get pretty cheap since as the global demand goes down, the point you are in the supply cost curve shifts so we ship to cheaper and cheaper sources. And so I expect that fossil fuels will get cheaper as competition gets stiffer. And so the, they aren't going to go out easily, but ultimately they're going to go out. This course will teach you five basic concepts needed to understand the current energy transition. One, because storytelling is an important part of how humans make sense of the world, you'll learn about three energy transition narratives. Two, data is critical to those narratives. So this course will explain three curves to help you understand the numbers associated with the adoption of new energy technologies. Three, previous energy transitions have involved commodities like coal, oil, and natural gas. This transition, however, is different. We'll explain three reasons why it's different. Four, while energy economists model how fast this transition will occur, they don't always agree. You'll learn about the slow, fast, and very fast scenarios. Finally, disrupting and transforming the global energy system creates problems. This course will explain three energy transition dilemmas faced by countries and 
companies. Humans tell stories to make sense of their world. Narratives are a series of stories that explain and simplify big, complex issues. Narratives are often used by self-interested actors inside and outside of the energy industry to promote a particular view of the future of energy. In a 2020 study, Dr. Marissa Beck of Positive Energy at the University of Ottawa identified two narratives. The first she called Reality One, but which we will call Oil and Gas Forever, where renewables add to the existing energy mix and there is no or little transition away from fossil fuels. The second narrative Dr. Beck described as reality two, or what we will call the world is on fire. This is the climate crisis narrative, with proponents demanding a quick phase out of oil and gas operations. In this course, we propose a third narrative. The future is electric, where new clean energy technologies are lower cost, and more efficient than oil and gas technologies, at first competing with them, then eventually displacing them in the global marketplace. All of these narratives describe some aspect of the energy transition, but only the future is electric aligns closely with energy transition theory, data, and evidence. The oil and gas forever narrative lauds the role that fossil fuels have played in the rise of human civilization. From wood and dung to whale oil, to coal, oil, and natural gas, there is no doubt that transitioning to supplies of ever more plentiful, lower-cost energy is key to modern prosperity. We should also mention the fossil fuels demand side, which includes the internal combustion engine, gas furnaces, and industrial processes. Since 1900, global primary energy has increased by 18 times. The global energy system of today is massive and complex. Extracting, processing, shipping, distributing, and consuming, not to mention building, financing, and regulating, all that energy has created a system with enormous inertia. Changing it will be difficult and slow. The oil and gas forever narrative accepts that climate change is a crisis, but argues that lowering greenhouse gas emissions in the existing energy system is better than building a new one. Oil and Gas Forever narrative has its roots with OPEC and is supported by the modeling in its World Oil Outlook 2045 report. Three important OPEC assumptions underpin this narrative. One, declining oil and gas demand in rich countries will be more than offset by rising demand in the emerging economies of the global south. Two, this trend will create more diversification of energy supply, not necessarily a transition to new forms of energy. Three, clean energy technologies aren't yet competitive with fossil fuels, and Global South governments can't afford to subsidize adoption of the new energy source. This narrative's biggest error is underestimating China's role as the driver of clean energy adoption. China's massive scale-up of both manufacturing and deployment is forcing the U.S. and Europe to adopt a similar strategy while exporting high volumes of low-cost energy technologies to Asia, Latin America, and Africa. A related miscalculation is assuming that governments will be less committed to climate policies in the future. In fact, the opposite is happening. Oil and gas forever extrapolates the energy status quo to the future, which serves the interests of incumbents like oil companies, but it's not a useful way to think about the energy transition. The world is on fire narrative is rooted in climate science and the global response to climate change since the Kyoto Accord in 1993 and the Paris Agreement in 2015. Climate activists and environmental groups lead the charge but a majority of global citizens accept that climate change is caused by humans and want their governments to do something about it. As extreme weather events grow, while droughts and floods become ever more common, calls to rapidly phase out fossil fuels become ever louder. The problem with this narrative is that many people recognize the problem, but few are willing to sacrifice their lifestyle to battle climate change. The world is on fire narrative is rooted in science and consistent with the evidence and data, 
but it is not enough on its own to affect a transition away from fossil fuels. The future is electric narrative is rooted in technology adoption theory, some of which you'll learn about in this course. The theory is important because this energy transition is technology-led instead of commodity-led like previous transitions. Understanding what the electric future might look like in 2050 or 2100 isn't easy. But what we can say today is that the clean energy technologies of the electric future are following similar patterns as technologies of the past. Projecting those trends to accelerate at even conservative rates suggests that the electric future is arriving sooner rather than later. The IEA's relatively cautious modeling gives us a glimpse of that future, with peak oil and gas demand by 2030 and even consumption by 2050 half or two-thirds less than today. Even more aggressive modeling describes a mid-century world the electric future that is almost unrecognizable to modern observers. Yet expert opinion, modeling studies, and data strongly favor the future is electric narrative. So there are two key facets, or even three key facets of being technology-led. The first is the costs are on learning curves. So the more you produce, the lower the cost gets, which of course is different to commodities where you get the cheapest stuff first and the cost will tend to rise over time. Um, the second is exponential growth. That is to say, you have a very, very typical technology type S-curve growth of uh, uh, rising very quickly from around 5% penetration to around 80% penetration. And then the third I would hazard is ubiquity. That's what's particularly interesting about technologies and specifically renewable technologies is that the solar solar wind are obviously everywhere and they're enormous. So the, these three facets are really is what makes th this clean energy revolution very, very different or this revolution very different to others.